This lecture will cover chapter six, which covers the clinical chemistry um, laboratory calculations. Now we won't go in depth of what spectrophotometry is um, because you do go over that in more detail in your other courses. However, in general, spectrophotometry is used to quantify the concentrations of various analytes based on the amount of light that the analyte absorbs. And so this is based on the theory of Beer's law, which states that the amount of absorbance of a solution is directly proportional to that solution's concentration. So in practical terms, the darker the solution means the higher the absorbance and the more concentrated that that particular solution is. So Beer's law states that A represented by absorbance or absorbance equals a times B times C, which equals absorptivity coefficient, the path length, as well as the concentration. The absorptivity coefficient is the amount of light absorbed by an analyte at a specific wavelength, and it is constant for a particular analyte at a particular wavelength if certain conditions such as temperature, solvent, pH remain constant. Now the path length is the dis distance that the light actually travels through the solution and if the analysis is performed correctly, it is also a constant. Thus, if we remove the two constants in the equation, then we will come up with, a, um, with an additional equation. So as you can see here, absorbance is directly proportional to the actual concentration. Beer's law is actually possible because of the concept of transmittance. So when a cuvette containing a solution that we're analyzing is actually placed inside of a spectrophotometer, the light can actually show, be shown through it. The solution will absorb some of that light, so this is the absorbance, but the remainder of the light will actually be transmitted through that cuvette and then be, um, be transmitted onto a photodetector. So when that photodetector actually gets that light on it, it actually measures that particular light or the transmittance of that light. That light on that photodetector is known as the um, incident light. So that particular light, um, we can use that to plug into an equation where the ratio of the amount of transmitted light is divided by the amount of that incident light, which is also known as transmittance. So this is demonstrated mathematically where transmittance equals the light that is transmitted over the light of the incident light, so that that is detected on that photo, detected, photo detector. So transmittance ratios range from um, 0 up to 1.0. By multiplying by 100, percent transmittance values can be obtained ranging from 0 to 100 on an actual linear scale. So if all the light is transmitted through the solution, that is, that no light is absorbed by the actual solution, then the transmit transmittance ratio is 1.0. And the percentage, percent transmission is actually 100, because 100% 100 of it transmits through the solution. If no light is transmitted through the solution, then the transmittance ratio is zero or zero transmittance. So all that light has been absorbed, 100% absorbed in the solution, which means no light is coming through it. Mathematically, transmittance and absorbance are related by the formula of A equals negative log times transmittance. So we can actually take that formula of absorbance equals negative log times transmittance and manipulate it a little bit to get an equivalent formula. And so you see that listed here, and then that can further be converted from a transmittance to a percent transmitting transmittance. And then from there, you will end up with the equation that absorbance equals 2.0 minus log percent transmittance. Now in contrast to transmittance ratio, absorbance values range from 0 0.000 to infinity on a logarithmic scale. So you can see here the pictures that indicate an absorbance and percent transmittance meter, meter. So you can notice how much easier it would be to actually interpret something on a linear scale for percent transmittance versus a, a logarithmic absorbance scale. And so by convention, absorbance values are reported to the third decimal place. So that would be like 0 0.000, whereas percent transmittance values are actually reported to the nearest tenth, 
with um, that being a percentage. So here we have an example where an MLT student was doing a manual creatinine assay using the Jaffe method. And so 45% transmittance reading was obtained from the cuvette that had the level one creatinine control and reagent that were mixed in this to get this reaction. So we wanna know what is the absorbance value? Well, to solve this, we would use the formula that we, that we just discussed where absorbance equals 2.0 minus log percent transmittance. So that would be the 45. So we'd use a calculator or you could actually use the logarithmic table um, and there is there is a copy of this in your textbook, but of course using a calculator is going to make this a whole lot easier. And so you would take the log of 45 um, and plug that into the equation, which is going to give you 1.653, and subtract that from the 2.0, which is going to give you your absorbance of 0 0.347. This means that a percent transmittance value of 45% is going to have an absorbance value of 0.347. So you may be trying to figure out, well, why is all of this important? Well, this is what's going to be the basis of establishing your standard curve that you will use on your instrumentation to actually determine what your unknown values are for your patient sample. So to do that, we first must actually make a standard curve. Now in the clinical laboratory, most assays do not actually use a single standard to, to quantify your unknown. So instead you use four to six standards of different concentrations that are spread out evenly across your linear range of that particular method. So by doing this, more of the linear range of that assay is actually covered by your standards when compared with a single standard method. So on many automated instruments, you'll have a series of standards or calibrators that are used to actually set the standard, standard curve that is stored in that particular instrument's computer data. And then what will happen, you'll have an electronic signal that's generated by the instrument um, based on that transmittance value of that particular sample. And then that's compared with the computer st computer's standard curve for that analyte that you're actually measuring from that sample. And then the computer is going to generate a quantitative result for that particular sample of that particular analyte in that sample. And then, of course, it's going to send that message to your um, the analyzer's computer or to your LIS, your laboratory information system, or to your printer or whatnot. Now, as a student, you're going to learn the concepts of actually constructing a standard curve and being able to graph it on some linear graph paper to determine the concentrations of standards um, or using the concentrations of those standards and graphing those on the x-axis and then taking the absorbance of whatever that standard is on your spectrophotometer and graphing that on the y-axis. And of course, this is going to give you um, a standard curve. So what we're going to do is kind of talk a little bit more about um, how to construct a standard curve. Now, anytime you do a manual assay using the spectrophotometer, you're going to follow Beer's Law. You're actually going to use a piece of linear graph paper, and then the standard curve of the absorbance obtained from the standards is going to actually give you a straight line. So the concentrations of the standards should range between the highest and the lowest range, the linear range of what you're trying to measure for that particular analyte. And two to three concentrations evenly spaced between the two outermost limits. And let's face it, we don't exactly live in a perfect world. So although our standard line should be a straight line, um, occasionally you have to do a line that's best fit. So it's not exactly point to point connect the dots because this can be skewed just a little bit. But you basically try to attempt to draw a line that best fits and best hits all of those data points. Additionally, this line should never extend beyond that highest point that's actually on that standard. Patient samples that have absorbances higher than that highest concentration of that standard need a dilution in order to determine that absorbance if it falls outside of that linear range. And of course, once you make that dilution, you need to reanalyze it and then factor in for that actual dilution that's being made. So standard curves are not limited to just the chemistry department. You also use these in hematology department as well. Um, so do keep that in mind.
So just a side note, a standard curve can actually be plotted using percent transmitting values. However, um, if you plot it on a linear graph paper, then the percent transmitting standard curve is actually, it has a curve to it, it's a um, curvy linear. And you can see an example of that here. So um, in order to form a straight line, the percent values must be plotted on a, the semi-logrammatic graph paper. Um, and so that, that we'll see here next. And here you see that same plot, just on a different graph paper. You can see the difference in um, how those lines are drawn on that graph paper. So it gives you that straight line. So obviously you'd have to have special graph papers to do this, so we don't really use this a lot. So now let's look at an example of how to actually construct that standard curve and then what you do with it after you've constructed it. So in this particular example, we are doing a manual glucose assay in which we have standards that measure out at 50 milligrams per deciliter, 100, 200, and 300. And of course, um, once we mix that solution and get that chemical reaction, perform that test, we know that this is the expected concentration of these. We know that the 50 milligram per deciliter should read 50 milligrams per deciliter on this particular analyzer on the spectrophotometer. So once we get that absorbance reading, we know that that is 0 0.150. And so then what we'll do is we'll actually plot that value for the 50 milligrams. So again, at the bottom, you've got your glucose concentration in milligrams per deciliter. And then of course, um, over here on the side, we have our absorbance. So we have our different absorbance readings that are measured out here. And then we plot the 50 milligrams. You can see where that first one here has been plotted. And then we do that for each of them. We plot them whatever their absorbance reading is. Once we get that plot, then we do our straight line, which is our best fit line. And for this particular one, it actually looks like it hits on each of the, um, each of our data points pretty, pretty evenly. But um, if it didn't, we would start at the zero and we would try to draw a line that best fits hitting all of those data points to give us that straight line. So now that we've got our standard curve established, we know that this particular concentrate will read at this particular absorbance. And so with that, we can do the same for our patient. So with our patient, we, we don't know how much of that glucose is in there, so we gotta figure that out. So if we run the test the same way we did with those standards, put it in the spectrophotometer and read it, then we are going to get the absorbance of that particular patient sample so that we can know what's the concentration of the glucose in that patient sample. So what we would do is actually use that standard curve on that graph paper that we just made, and we will figure out where does that absorbance of 0 0.0400 hit on that scale. So with that absorbance reading of 0 0.400, we would actually find it on our graph paper and we would use a straight edge and we would go all the way across until we hit our point of interception so we can see here where it intercepts on that line and then if you go all the way down then you would figure out what the actual concentration is so in this particular patient our concentration of where it intercepts that is 135 milligrams per deciliter so this would be what would be reported out for this patient's glucose concentration. So chemical reactions in chemistry can have either an endpoint or a kinetic reaction. So with endpoint assays, the measure it actually measures the absorbance of the reaction at the completion of the reaction, so when it ends. And this, this means that many of your manual chemistry tests that are wet chemistry, meaning that it's done on a liquid matrix versus dr using dry reagents. Um, when they're performed by a student in like a clinical laboratory, these are all endpoint type assays where you actually have some sort of incubation period, um, could be a few minutes to 15, 20 minutes that allows that reaction to actually take place. Now with endpoint assays, you can actually use a single standard, a standard curve, or you can use um, a, another method known as a molar absorbt, absorb, absorptivity method in order to calculate the concentration of that patient sample. Now with endpoint assays, um, they may use an enzymes within the reaction as part of that reagent.
but analysis of the enzyme itself is not performed as an endpoint reaction. So in many laboratories, analytes are actually measured using a very large multi-channel random access analyzer. And so, um, and this kind of helps with the speed process of actually doing those reactions because multiple samples can be, be done at one time. And so in order to do that, you actually need kinetic reactions. So a kinetic reaction differs from the endpoint reactions. Um, and this is because that the reaction does not go all the way to completion, but rather the absorbents are taken at various intervals for short periods um, throughout that testing process. So some analyzers will actually continuously monitor the absorbance readings instead of actually uh, monitoring the various uh, fixed intervals in order to improve accuracy. So in any reaction, whether it's kinetic or endpoint, there are various phases that also have to be, um, that we have to pay attention to. So these three phases are going to include the lag phase in which the reactant reagents are first starting to react together, and then you have the reacting phase in which the product is actually formed, so whatever you're looking for, and then the reagent depletion phase, which you can see here on this graph. So in the lag phase, the absorbance of the product is not constant. So in the reactant phase, the absorbance actually starts to change. If there is more reactant than reagent can react with, then the third phase, which a reagent is actually start, starting to be depleted, this is when this happens. So in this phase, the absorbance values will remain the same. In an endpoint assay, the reagents are in excess, so you have too much of the actual reagent, that the reagent depletion phase doesn't actually happen. So rather, the reaction is allowed to proceed past that phase until all of, all of that particular reactant has been used up. So at this point, the absorbance is stable. But in a kinetic reaction, the absorbance readings are taken during the second phase. And so um, that change in absorbance or that delta absorbance is what is actually measured. So now let's talk about um, enzymatic type reactions and the um, enzyme kinetics of those. With first order reactions, these are reactions in which the enzyme is in excess and the substrate concentration or the concentration of the analyte that we're looking to measure is the actual limiting factor. So in first order reactions, the substrate concentration is low relative to the enzyme concentration. So a low substrate concentration, at a low substrate concentration, these rates of reaction is dependent on the substrate concentration. So first order reactions tend to be used when non-enzyme analytes are being measured and an enzyme, an enzyme or other enzymes are used in that particular reaction sequence, sequence as part of your actual reagent. Now when the activity of an enzyme needs to be measured, conditions of the assay are maintained in order to allow for zero order, of, order kinetics to actually occur. So with zero order kinetics, the rate of the reaction is directly proportional to the enzyme, the enzyme concentration, and it's independent of the substrate concentration. So with this, the substrate is actually kept in excess, so you have too much of it. This means that the rate limiting factor is the concentration of the, of the enzyme that you're actually looking for and measuring. So zero order kinetics gives us the following reaction that will actually take place. So when you have the enzyme and the substrate mixed together, that's going to yield an enzyme substrate complex, which then will additionally yield the enzyme plus the product. Now keep in mind that the temperature, the pH, and any other variables are kept at a constant during these reactions, whereas the, um, the any kind of secondary enzymes that you use in this reaction are also kept in excess um, along with um, any of the substrates that are also used. And so there is a special equation that's actually used to do this calculation. Now this is not something that I'm going to make you know. Um, it's just so that you can understand how the analyzers actually use this process to, to actually get the calculations for these results when, you're, you, when you have um, a sample put on the machine and it actually runs through an enzymatic type type reaction. So if your analyzer uses a zero order kinetics, it's actually 
using this to do those calculations. So again, I'm not going to go a lot into um, how these constant, this uh, calculation is done, but you can see here the, the curve of the velocity versus the substrate concentration for the zero order kinetics um, kind of helps to illustrate that particular equation. Um, and here it kind of lists some of the variables dependent on that. Now, while most of your chemistry tests do have standards that are made for um, to be able to establish those limits, um, just know that standards may not be available for many of your enzymes. So um, it may be possible that you have to actually do a determination of the activity. So this is something that could be done within the analyzer, but there is, there is an equation to do that, of course. An example of this type of reaction would be a kinetic creatinine kinase assay. Um, in which you know it was man manually performed using a coenzyme NADH as part of that as part of that reaction indicator, and so you know in this particular example we'd want to figure out what is the concentration of the level one QC. So you would have your volumes of your various reagents, your um, absorbance uh, readings and whatnot. You'll have your your set values that you will know and you would plug, get those plugged into the equation that ultimately would give you your result for that particular QC reaction. Buffers are solutions of weak acids or bases and they're salts that resist changes in pH. So for example, during so serum protein electrophoresis, the pH of the solution that conducts the current is maintained by a buffer. So buffers are actually used in other areas of clinical laboratory as well, as including um, your molecular diagnostics department. So the pH of any solution is determined by its acidity. So a simple definition of an acid is that, that of a substance that will donate a hydrogen ion or a proton. And a base is a substance that will accept that particular hydrogen ion or donate a hydroxyl ion. So this definition is known as the Bronsted theory. And with the Bronsted acid that has donated a hydrogen ion, um, it will, will then become a Bronsted base. The acid is termed a conjugate acid and the newly formed base is termed the conjugate base. So some examples of conjugate acids and conjugate base pairs um, carbonic acid forming bicarbonate. Now our acid or our base can be termed strong or weak depending on its tendency to disassociate. So strong acids or bases will completely disassociate when they're actually in a solution. So example of this would be hydrochloric acid as a strong acid. So when placed in water it will it will completely disassociate the hydrogen and the chlorine ions. Now this disassociation is a constant Ka, which determines the relative strength of an acid or base. And so here we have the equation for calculating Ka for weak acid or base. So again, if you kind of do some manipulations and move some things around and substitute some things in, then you can actually um, fix this equation so that something that's a little bit more understandable, which gives you the henderson hasselbalch equation, where pH equals pKa plus log of the um, salt of the acid over the un un disassociated acid. So this helps us to understand that if the ratio of salt to acid is 1, then the pH is going to equal the pKa or the disassociation constant. This means that the buffer is at a maximal buffering capacity. Now in an acid solution, raising the pH above the pKa is going to cause an increase, it's an increase in the disassociation of the acid, it's going to increase the amount of hydrogen ions, and it's also going to lower the pH. Now in a basic solution, if the pH is below the pKa, the more the hydroxyl ions will actually be released, and this is going to actually lower the pH. So here we have an example where our technologist is to prepare a phosphate buffer by adding 5.874 grams of monopotassium phosphate, 
and 1.191 grams of its salt, which is the dipotassium phosphate. And you would add this to water to make a 1.0 liters of water. Now, the pKa of the buffer is known to be 7.2. So we want to know what is the pH of the phosphate buffer? So we would use our equation. We'd figure out what the conjugate acid is and what the conjugate base is. Now, this is this all goes back to chemistry, organic chemistry for this. Um, so when all that's plugged in, we get our equation um, that's noted here to the side. So then our next step is to actually determine the molarity of each of those compounds based on the quantity of grams of each of them. So we would get those actual molecular weights for them. And then we would use our molarity formula to do that calculation for, for each of those. And from there, we plug those values in, continue to work our, our problem out using the rules of logarithm, and then ultimately come to the pH of our solution. So why is all of this important? Well, this kind of helps us with understanding acid-base balance and how to get those acid-base calculations. Because the pH of the body is strictly controlled by the carbonic acid by carbonic buffer system. And so when you kind of plug all this stuff into these equations, then um, it gives us that a pKa for carbonic acid by car by carbonic buffer system is going to be 6.10 at um, 37 degrees Celsius, which is body temperature. And so we know that the waste product of cell metabolism is CO2, and that is carried within the plasma from tissue to our lungs um, in different forms. But the three most important are a gas dissolved in plasma. So um, that's going to be your your carbonic acid. So um, and then it can also be further broken down into um, carbaminohemoglobin, carb um, which is going to exist within the red blood cells. So this whole system is just a balance of um, a balance of status that's going to be dependent upon the particular actions of the lungs and the kidneys. Um, and being able to actually do the adjustments to that pH as things kind of shift throughout the body. Now the ratio of bicarbonic to carbonic acid is about a 20 to 1, but with, within the blood, the pH of the blood is directly affected by that particular concentration of the bicarbonate and inversely affected by the concentration of that carbonic acid. So with your blood gas instruments, the partial pressure of CO2 can be measured as pCO2. Now there is a relationship between the bicarbonate and the pCO2. Um, and so you can see that listed here with the solubility coefficient of pCO2. Um, under equilibrium conditions, carbonic acid forms that dCO2. Now we plug everything in and substitute it. It gives us, it lets us know that dCO2 is um, is actually equal to the solubility coefficient of pCO2. And so we can plug that in to get our equation for pH based off of this. So how this is actually used within the lab is that um, you know we can measure to figure out how much bicarbonate concentration there is. So we would do this by um, for example, here we actually have our pCO2 values and our pH. If we plug that into the equation, um, then once that equation is worked out, then it's actually going to give us our bicarbonate level for that particular patient in that sample. Now the pH of blood is usually maintained between uh, 7.35 and 7.45. Now I'm not going to go into pathophysiology of how this all happens, um, but it is a balance between the kidneys and the lungs working together to make sure it maintains that balance. So if one or the other or both is off, then obviously you're going to have some changes. Now, if the pH drops too low, it's considered an acidosis, and if it goes too high, it's considered an alkalosis. So these changes, um, you can actually, you know, again, kind of plug those into, into these equations, and then it kind of... Um, you can kind of start getting a visualization of how this whole process is, is taking place within the body. So a way to visualize that is the relationship between bicarbonate and carbonic acids, which is actually your relationship between your kidneys and your lungs. So again, you're going to learn a little bit more about this in your actual chemistry course, but
um, just be aware that there are some disorders that can actually happen when there's an imbalance that takes place. So that's why it's important for us to do these blood, blood gas measurements in order to figure out what exactly is going on. So with respiratory acidosis, your pH of your blood is actually acidic. Um, the respiratory part of it means that the major cause of it is the actual acidosis. Now, if the lungs cannot adequately, adequately remove that CO2, that CO2 is going to start to build up, which is going to mean that that PCO2 level is going to increase, which is actually going to result in a lowering of that pH. Um, a reciprocal relationship between the CO2 concentration and the pH means that if that PCO2 is going up, that means that pH is actually coming down. Now, with respiratory alkalosis, um, just as it suggests, you have an increase in pH that's caused by a drop in that, those CO2 levels. And so then some compensation can take place um, where your body is just kind of decreasing the respiration rates or the kidneys actually starting to retain some of those hydrogen ions so that it can try to actually start to balance some stuff out. With metabolic acidosis, this is caused by a metabolic increase in acid. So this is seen a lot with your, your diabetics when they're in diabetic ketoacidosis. So the body's actually compensating by trying to increase your respiration rate to get rid of that CO2. Um, and it's actually raising the pH. And then the kidneys are going to respond by increasing those acid secretions and, the, and have that bicarbonate retention. So this is a lot of times why diabetics will test for those ketones and stuff within um, doing those urine strips. Now with metabolic, me metabolic alkalosis, this is primarily caused by an excess of your bicarbonate. So this may result from an insufficient excretion of bicarbonate by the kidneys. So there could be something going on there in the, the kidneys that's causing it not to filter that out. Um, an increased ingestion of bicarbonate, such as like with your antiacids, or if a patient has been vomiting a lot, which can lead to a loss of hydrogen ions and a buildup of bicarbonate as well. Now the body will actually compensate for this by um, with the lungs actually starting to decrease respiration to kind of try to retain that CO2. And then the kidneys will excrete more of that bicarbonate. So this whole thing is really kind of a seesaw mechanism of balance there. But in order to determine the acid base status, we've got to look at the pH. So again, patients that are above 7.45, those are considered to be in, in an alkalosis type state, whereas if they're below 7.34 or 5, they're in an acidic state. So we look at those bicarbonate values. Does it fit the pH? In other words, the bicarbonate values move in the same direction as the pH. So if pH is, is alkaline, then is the bicarbonate elevated above the normal? If the pH is acidic, is that bar bicarbonate below the normal range? So we've got to also look at the PCO2. Is it what is expected given the pH? Um, and this is where we kind of look at compensation. So when a metabolic problem affects the pH, those lungs are going to immediately react to try to bring that pH back into a normal range. And your kidneys can take a little bit longer to get that pH back into a normal range, but they do, they do try to work on that by, through the excretion. Now the body never overcompensates. So in other words, it's not going to take you too far in one direction after you've been too far in another direction. The body has uh, comp the body's able to compensate when that pH um, is once it's back in normal range, then it's already done its job. So it's going to kind of shut off those mechanisms. It's not going to keep going. So the bicarbonate and pCO2 levels are very um, they could be very abnormal, but as long as the pH and the body is within range, then the body has actually done its job. So you could still see those values kind of off, but everything's kind of brought back into line. So what all this does, it helps us to determine what actually caused the initial problem and what had to happen in order for that compensation to take place. So whereas the analyte that has moved in the anticipated direction of the pH is actually the culprit. The analyte that has moved opposite of what you would expect to see of the pH is actually the one that's doing the compensation. So let's look at an example. So a patient comes to the ER and they have an asthma attack, trouble um, 
and they're having trouble with with exhaling so blood gas is performed we get those values here so we want to determine um, what is this patient's acid base status and we want to know is this patient compensating um, for it now it's not necessarily something that you're going to do in the lab you're basically just going to send out the results but this is what the physician is looking for so for this particular patient pH 7.5 which means the patient is in an alkaline state so that, um, at this point they have not brought that pH into the normal range so the pCO2 is abnormally low and the bicar bicarbonate is normal so based on this um, with the patient's asthma, we can determine that um, they've not compensated. They're in respiratory alkalosis and they have not yet compensated for this. So just like the body strives to maintain that 20 to 1 balance between the bicarbonate and the carbonic acid, the body also tries to maintain the electrolyte neutrality balance. So the concentration of anions should be equal to the concentration of the cation, cations within the body. Now, the measurement of this balance is done by actually getting the anion gap. So what the anion gap does is it doesn't actually measure all of the anions and cations within the body, but just those of the highest concentration that could actually significantly alter any sort of balance that's taking place in the body. So a cation is found in the highest concentration in blood, and that, that particular one that is in the highest is actually sodium. Now chloride is the most abundant anion within the blood. Bicarbonate is also an anion, and it is included within that anion gap. Now some laboratories will use potassium in this calculation. However, the concentration of potassium is relatively low compared to the others. Um, but here you can see the equation listed for both. So here we have an example where a 58-year-old woman who's insulin dependent, she's known diabetic, she comes to the ER and she's in a comatose type state. So they run her electrolytes. Um, most likely they're just going to do this in a basic chemistry panel um, or CMET panel, but they run it and get those values. Um, and then once they get those values, they'll plug those into the anion gap. Now your analyzers will actually do this for you which is also a good check um, when you're reviewing results just to make sure that this this anion gap is not a negative number if you've got a negative number or something that could be a good indicator that something's wrong with your machine or your sample and you might need to rerun it but getting back to what we're discussing here um, with your anion gap when you plug those values in you can get the calculation and we see here we've got the calculation using um, with the potassium without they're they're pretty close um, so whatever your lab uses it will establish the reference ranges for this of what's acceptable and not acceptable now how are we going to use these values what, what are we going to do with them once we get them well what this says it actually helps you to be able to detect any sort of changes in concentrations of anything that's been unmeasured any anions or cations that haven't been measured so for example if it's elevated it could be due to the presence of other anions such as various proteins um, most commonly would be your acids such as like your keto acids like when your diabetic patients um, go into that diabetic um, ketoacidosis state and a decreased anion gap could be seen when there is an increase in unmeasured cations such as magnesium or calcium. Now, in addition, the anion gap could be, like I said, a quality assurance measurement to make sure that you, you, are, um, you have reliability in those electrodes and determining that electrolyte concentration. So this is one of those numbers you're going to take a quick, quick peek at before you send out those results, just as a quality check. So the osmolality of a solution is based on the number of dissolved particles in a solution, not on the actual size, weight, or ionic activity of those particles. Now a one molal solution of glucose is also a one osmolal solution because glucose does not disassociate, whereas a one molal solution of sodium chloride is equal to a two os osmol solution because the sodium chloride disassociates into sodium particles and chloride particles. Now osmolality measures the total concentration of all the ions and molecules present in serum or urine. So sodium, glucose, and urea are major contributors to the total 
osmolality of serum. Now, now because major contributors to serum osmolality are tightly regulated, the osmolality of serum can actually be calculated. So the number 1.86 is used because each of the sodium ions is balanced by an anion, but there is not a perfect disassociation. So 18 is used because the molecular weight of glucose is approximately 180, and the factor of 18 converts milligrams to deciliters to millimoles per liter. So the molecular weight of BUN is approximately 28, therefore 2.8 is used. This formula can't be used for calculating urine osmolality because the concentration of those particles vary greatly. And so depending on the structure or depending on um, the hydration state, it's going to actually play some factors into this. So here we have an example where 78-year-old 70, males admitted to the ED with a heat stroke. Um, we've ran our, our lab, work, lab work there, and we're trying to determine based off these values what is the serum osmolality. So to do that calculation, you plug all those values in, and then you come up with um, your serum osmolality for this particular patient. Now the osmol gap is the difference between the calculated osmolality and the measured osmolality. So the average osmol gap is about 0 to 10. Um, when the gap is elevated, it's usually due to other particles besides the um, sodium, glucose, or BUN. So the presence of ketones or alcohol, such as like an ethanol in the serum, um, can cause that to be elevated. So an osmol, os osmol gap may be very useful as a um, quality assurance type indicator when you're um, when you're looking to whether or not to release these results. So just to kind of make sure that there's nothing that could be interfering. So here we have an example, 54-year-old female found unconscious, admitted to the hospital. Um, we've got our la her lab results here. Um, and of course, we will need to plug all of that into our equation. We also have her, our, her serum um, ETOH or her ethanol. So when we plug all of those in, um, we get those calculations. First we get that osmolality, and then we get the, os the osmol gap, so the difference between the calculated and the measured. Um, once we figure that out, we've got that value. In this particular patient, it is indicative of the presence of other dissolved particles in the serum. So that leads us to believe that that ethanol that's present in her serum is what's causing that to be so increased. So coronary artery disease is one of the leading causes of death today. So consequently, patients and physicians are always trying to figure out um, you know, how to determine their risk factors and using laboratory work to be able to determine that. So what we use is actually measurements of total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides um, to help us assess that risk. While there are only a few methods out there that will actually measure the LDL, um, we're able to actually perform that calculation using um, the Frederall formula to actually do that calculation. So that, that calculation is listed here, which uses the total cholesterol, HDL, and the triglycerides divided by 5. Now just to note that triglycerides divided by 5 is actually an estimate too of VLDL. Um, and so the formula is not accurate if the, the actual triglyceride concentration is greater than 400. So, um, and we have to assume that no other sources of tri triglycerides are present, like calomicrons. So in order to ensure that, you just want to make sure that your patient is fasting when you collect these results or collect, collect these labs to obtain these results. Now again, our analyzers are starting. There are some methods that are starting to be developed that will actually analyze it directly, but you still have some labs where the calculations will be performed. So here we have an example, 43-year-old man um, with a family history of coronary artery disease, and then he's had his lipid profile performed. We've got those, those values here. We're trying to figure out the LDL. Um, if you remember HDL, that's considered your healthy cholesterol, and then your LDL is your lousy um, cholesterol. So um, figuring out those values based off 
of this calculation is going to kind of help you assess that. So if you plug all of these in, do the calculations, then you get an LDL of 200.